Good morning and welcome to our live broadcast at First Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to come into your home today with good news about God who loves you. We are located in beautiful Uptown Columbus on the corner of 11th and 1st. We would love for you to join us for worship or just stop by and say hello. At First Presbyterian Church, we welcome you with grace and gratitude for God's love. The scripture says, O oh, taste and see that the God is good. Happy are those who take their refuge in the Lord. Come, O oh, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Let us worship God. Please be seated. For God so loved the world that God sent his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In trust and in confidence for God's love for us, let us confess our sin together. God of mercy, 
You sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O Lord, and forgive our sin. Return us the paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Apostle Paul shared in the letter to the Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting, the message, entrusting us with the message of reconciliation. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Please be seated. Good morning. Some of you guys were taking a little time getting down here, huh? Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Well, this morning in Sunday school, we talked about something that's really interesting, and I was thinking about it. We talked about how to have self-control. Self-control, right? When I hear that word control, it kind of makes me do this. Uh-oh, I better behave, right? Yeah. So when we hear that word control, it kind of has a reaction in us. Good morning. But I wanted to think about something else this morning. I thought about maybe changing that up a little bit and calling it, instead of self-control, calling it self-choice. Because as Christians, we all know what? We know that God is in control, not us, right? So what we have is self-choice. We have the choice to decide whether to do the right thing or whether to do the wrong thing, whether to follow or whether to go away. You know, our scripture this morning talks about the lost sheep, which is really interesting because I was thinking about when my children were small and I had my little flock around me, four of those little flocks running around, yes? If one of them walked away, what do you think I would do? Yeah, of course I'd go looking for them. If I had the others all secure and, you know, one walked away, I wouldn't just go, oh, well, that's just Henry. I won't worry about him. No. And that's exactly what God does. That's what Jesus talks about when he talks about the lost sheep. He talks about the shepherd who has all these sheep. And when one goes away, he goes after that one. Because it's just like when we go away from Jesus, when we go away from God and we sin, he wants us to come back and repent. When we exercise that self-choice to do the right thing, we're empowered. That's a pretty cool thing. Because we know what's right. 
it's been clearly laid out for us, right? We know it's right to follow God. We know it's right to follow the laws of God and to, and to be like Jesus, to be kind, right? Those Ten Commandments we talk about. But sometimes we make the wrong choice. Sometimes we go another way. When we do that, what happens? We turn away from God and we stop following. We start going over here and doing our own thing, right? But he wants to come back and he says, hey, come on back over here. I want you back. I want you back with me. And I want to love you. Even though you made a mistake, even though you made a bad choice in your self-choice, I want you to come back to me and to be with me. And I'm going to love you anyway. And that's what, he's, that's what he's doing every day. Bringing you back, bringing you back, bringing you back. So when you get that opportunity, you've got A and B, right and wrong, in front of you. Let's make that right self-choice. Let's decide we're going to do the right thing and stay right there with God. Okay? We're going to talk about this a lot more because this is a big subject when we go upstairs. But right now, let's say a prayer, shall we? Cool. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day. Lord, we're just watching everything bloom and, and turn into spring outside. Lord, we thank you that when we walk away, you come looking for us and you bring us back. We want to be with you, Lord, but sometimes in our own selves and in our own humanity, we make the wrong choice and we sin and we turn away. Lord, help us to remember to come back to you when those times come. Help us to remember that you are always there for us. We just need to stay beside you and stay close and not turn away. Lord, thank you for seeking us. Help us to seek you. In Christ's name, amen. All right, let's go, guys. Good morning. It is good that we are here together to worship God on this wonderful, beautiful March morning here in Columbus, Georgia. We want to welcome everyone. I invite you to, in the sanctuary to take the friendship pads that are in the uh, rack near the end of the aisle and use that as a way of celebrating that we are here together and speak and share with each other. I want to welcome those of you who are worshiping with us through our television ministry on WRBL, wherever you are, in Alabama or in uh, Georgia, and we know that there are those who are literally around the world who are watching us, and so we welcome you from Oregon and from Korea and from other places where we have heard from you, and we are gracious, gr grateful to have you with us this day as we worship in this place today. I want to highlight some announcements that are in the bulletin for you. There is an annual meeting of the congregation next Sunday, and the notice is in the, uh, in the book, in, in the booklet. Um, there will be annual reports distributed, and uh, the business that will be before you will be to elect an officer nominating committee of four persons, and they are, uh, this information is shared in the bulletin. Um, on March 19th, there is a church trip to uh, Massey Lane's Gardens uh, to see the, the wonderful flowers. The spring is, is a, among us, and so please uh, make note of that. And Holy Week is almost here. Easter is, is coming during Holy Week, uh, we will be the host here at First Presbyterian for uh, Valley Interfaith Promise, the VIP program, and we will be hosting a family in our, in our church that week. There are a number of opportunities that are before you that are listed in the, in the bulletin. And also, as we prepare for Easter Sunday, uh, we will have uh, Easter lilies here in the, in the sanctuary, and if you would like to order one in honor or in memory of someone, please, please do that through the form that's, that's there. Uh, this is the day that God has made as we rejoice and as we prepare to do that. Let us prepare our hearts to listen to Scripture. I invite you to stand that we may sing the hymn for illumination.
first reading is from the Old Testament, from the book of Joshua. It describes the scene when the children of Israel had crossed from wilderness into the land of promise, but before all was secure, the covenant was reestablished, and we hear this account beginning in Joshua 5, verse 9. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that this place is to be called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening of the 14th day of the month on the plains of Jericho. On the day after Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Cana that year. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. I invite you to stand as we hear the Scripture from the New Testament. Luke 15 is a story, has has three stories in it. One is the story of a lost coin, one is the story of a lost sheep that Debbie shared with the children, and the third is the one I will read with you this day. Let us listen that we may hear what God is saying to us. 
Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable, beginning in verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that will belong to me. And he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living, where he spent everything. There was a severe famine that took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to the citizens of the country who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up. And I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, and he put his arms around him, and he kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned before heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on his feet. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder brother was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing. He called one of the slaves, and he asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother came home, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then the older brother became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But the brother answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave to you. I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and has been found." The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Several blocks from here up the street on 2nd Avenue, there is a church that has one of those signs that they change every so often. For the last several weeks, the sign has read, Some people feel the rain, others just get wet. Hmm. When I first saw that, I went, that's interesting. But the more I pass by that sign, the more I am convinced that there is something there. Do you feel the rain or do you just get wet? When it's one of those cold, blustery days and there's a downpour and you have to travel some distance, you have to walk some distance outside. You have your jacket and, and your hood pulled up over it. Do you feel the rain when, when it collects on the rim of the hood and it drops down on your face? You feel the cold? Maybe you're out so long that it soaks through your coat and do you feel the, the tinge of sensation when it touches your skin. Soon it will be really warm and summery, and the summer rains will come. Do you feel the rain when you're outside in a thund summer thunderstorm and it, it soaks through you, and you feel refreshment 
and your insides giggle a little bit? Do you feel that? Or do you just get wet? Soaking wet. I think the difference between feeling the rain and getting wet might be the difference between the two brothers in this story of the lost son. We call it the parable of the prodigal son. Prodigal meaning living lavishly in lifestyle and wasting a lot. But that word prodigal is something that we have attributed to it. It's not there in the Scripture, but it's certainly there. And the focus is easily cast on that younger brother who takes the portion of his inheritance. Can you imagine the audacity of saying, Dad, I want what's mine. I'm getting out of here. The audacity. And then he leaves, and he goes to the New Testament equivalent of Las Vegas where nothing is remembered. But we know that there are always cameras there anyway, so we, we be careful about what we do. But he's gone, and he li lives a, a lavish and a sumptuous, a, a wasteful lifestyle. And there's that older brother who stands and wonders, what's in this for me? How, how dare this younger brother of mine take what he has had and runs away? They are both in different sorts of wildernesses. The younger one is in the wilderness of, of spending all that he's had and, and throwing it away. He's undisciplined. He's dissipated. He's a wretch. He wastes it all. And he is in a place where he has had choices to make. But I think there's an another wilderness, and that's the wilderness of the older brother. He is surrounded by his father's bounty. He works in the family business, but he does not have any joy. He feels enmity toward his younger brother who has the audacity to ask for something, and then who executes a plan. Maybe, maybe the older brother was jealous. Maybe that's what the older brother wanted to do. It doesn't really say that, but maybe it's possible. The older brother lives in a spiritual wilderness as well. It is not a place of debauchery or dissolute living, but it is a place where he has lost his soul, even amidst all the things that are familiar. That image of wilderness is powerful in our Christian imagination. Sometimes we think of the wilderness as a, as a desert, and when the word desert tickles into your ears, what do you hear? Do you hear the Sahara Desert pictured? The sand dunes with the blowing grains of sand? Or, or maybe the um, great desert that's in the in Death Valley in California? Or maybe some other desert that you've pictured? Or maybe you've even been there. We see images all the time for these difficult and desolate places. They are wildernesses. They are places that are devoid of life, or seemingly so. They are places that, deserts are places that do not have enough moisture to sustain much growth, but they can sustain some. When the children of Israel left Egypt, God said to them, I will give you a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day to mark your journey through this wilderness. And then when they complained that they were hungry, God gave them food, manna from heaven. One morning they awoke and there was the ground covered. And they said, what is it? And that's literally what manna means. That's the meaning of the Hebrew word. What is it? What is it that's on the ground here? What is this that we are to eat with? What is it? How can we be provided with this what is it in life? But then there came a day when that what is it ended. After the children of Israel had arrived into the land of promise, 
And before they were fully secure in chapter 5 of Joshua, it says, the what is it ended, and they ate what the land provided. Before they had gone around the city of Jericho the seven times and the walls came tumbling down, the what is it ended, and they were left to make their way on the bounty of the earth. When we find ourselves needing the what is it of manna, we know that we are in a wilderness. But also, when we find the what is it of manna disappears as it will, we find ourselves in a different kind of wilderness, in a different kind of need. We have our stories of faith and life, and we seek to make meaning out of them. Presbyterian minister and author Frederick Buechner tells a lot of stories. He wrote this about the storytelling process. He says, our stories are all about searching. We search for a good self to be and good work to do. We search to become human in a world that tempts us always to be less than human or looks to us to be more. We search to love and to be loved. And in a world where it is often hard to believe in much of anything, we search to believe in something holy and beautiful and life transcending that will give meaning and purpose to the lives we live. We search for the what is it. We search for that part of our inheritance that will let us have meaning. Sometimes, though, we get bored in our searches. Sometimes we f may feel like we have been betrayed by others that we trust. Sometimes we may even become a little bit mischievous. And so we go down different paths. We take different roads, and we find ourselves in a wilderness, the wilderness of the younger son who was living a desolate life, or the wilderness of the older brother who was around, surrounded by all the things that were familiar. We search for meaning and we hope and goodness, and we latch on to those things where they are. Sometimes we, we look at the other side of the tracks. The, the grass is always greener, and we seek to, to go that way. But sometimes, maybe more often than we want to admit, we hold on to what we have. We glorify the past. We refuse to let new learning shape our understanding of the past, and we refuse to let new learning shape our possibilities for the future, we become satisfied. It was good enough for my ancestors, so it's good enough for me. We allow our soul to be sucked out for the convenience and maybe for medical insurance coverage. We make deals and we find a reason to stay put. Maybe not geographically, but emotionally and spiritually, just to stay where we are. We are in those days and those times in a soul-sucking wilderness. Then something happens. Somehow our world is rocked. What we thought wouldn't happen doesn't. We come home and we find that the father we thought we knew has received those who ran away back into the household. What about us? We were loyal. We were good. We, were, we never left. What about us? What have you given us? This week, Pat Conroy died. He was the author of several popular and some powerful bestsellers, The Water is Wide, The Prince of Tides, The Be Beach Music, South of Broad. You may have known or heard of some of these. 
but he is probably best known for the way he wove autobiographical details of his life, particularly as the child of a military family, into his fiction. One of those works became a movie called The Great Santini, starring Robert De Niro. Another was The Lords of Discipline, which told of a fictional military college in South Carolina. That military college, some thought, was based on the Citadel, the military college of South Carolina. Conroy actually was a graduate of the Citadel. He never applied. His father did. He didn't want to go there. It gave him a lot of material to write about, too. When the Lords of Discipline appeared in the late 70s and early 80s, many people associated with the Citadel took umbrage at it. They felt like this fictional college was not so fictional, and it told stories of hazing and horrible racism. And they rejected the one who told the story. Conroy's relationship suffered, not with everybody there, but with enough people, and he found himself in a wilderness of being cast out. The rift damaged his relationships. But as the years went by, the rift was tended to, and eventually it was mended. And in 2001, Pat Conroy gave the commencement address at the Military College of South Carolina. Now, I am not a Citadel graduate, and I am not a South Carolinian, but I do enjoy his writing, and I think he has powerful stories to tell. And certainly, The Lords of Discipline was one of those stories. The Lords of Discipline begins with this line, the very first line, I wear this ring. Conroy told the graduating class of the Citadel in 2001, he said, I think it is the best line I have ever written and the best English sentence I am capable of writing. I guess many authors, like many preachers, look for that good line, that one line that you want to claim credit for for all time. I wear this ring. He was proud of that. And even though the Lords of Discipline tells the story of a fictional place, it is obvious that the statement was meaningful to him about how he felt about his alma mater, about his college. In a real way, he was in a wilderness from that college. It was not the wilderness of the prodigal son nor that of the older brother. It was a wilderness that came about when there are differences of opinions and convictions that something better is possible. Maybe by telling a story, I can shape some part of our future together. And that took him to a place that was like a wilderness, like a barren land. The way out of that wilderness for Conroy and for the Military College of South Carolina came through his writing. He wrote more. This time, he explicitly wrote about the Citadel. My Losing Season was the title of a book that tells the tale of the basketball team of the Citadel in 1966-67. It so happens that Conroy played on that team. And you can guess from the title of the, of the book, My Losing Season, that it was about a team that lost and a season that lost. But else, what else was gained? As he prepared to write the book, he interviewed classmates. And one of the classmates that he interviewed was a man by the name of Al Kraboth. After graduation, Kraboth went on to be a Marine pilot in Vietnam. He was shot down and held captive by the Viet Cong and then the North Vietnamese. The, in their interview time, they talked not simply about the basketball season, 
but also about how that shaped and prepared him for those years in captivity. And eventually, he was released. But he told Conroy that as he was prepared to be released, to come back to the United States, even before he arrived back here in the States, he came across another classmate who was also in the service, Johnny Vaughn. Vaughn had been a cheerleader for that losing season team. And Vaughn asked Kroboth if he still had his Citadel ring. He did not. The captors had taken it. He had lost it. It was gone. So Vaughn said to Kroboth, he said, here, take my ring. I don't want you returning home without wearing a Citadel ring. Kroboth didn't want to take it, but he did, and he put it on. Conroy had written the line, I wear this ring without knowing the story of Al Kroboth and Johnny Vaughn. But he knew what it represented. He knew that the ring was a symbol of identity and connection that transcended war. It transcended imprisonment. It transcended hazing. It transcended all of the uncertainties in life. That ring was a symbol for what united and brought those men together. When he was speaking to the graduate, graduating class in 2001, Conroy told this story, and then he segued. And he said, I have an invitation to you. I want you, class of 2001, I want you to come to my funeral, whenever it is. And given the news that he just died this week, this makes this story, I think, even more powerful. I want you to come to my funeral. I've told my family, and they will make preparations for you. And all you have to do is come to the church where the service is held, find an usher, and hold up your hand and say, I wear this ring. As I said, I am not a Citadel graduate, but I am profoundly moved by the power of this story for the way in which the symbolism cuts through all of the wilderness experiences that were experienced by these people, isolation and exile, war and captivity, disputes over practical matters of governance and how and who is involved, the ring cut through. There are ways there are things that hold us together when we wander into the wilderness of life. Sometimes when we go into wildernesses, we do exactly what the older and younger brother did. We flee. We run as far away from what we can. Sometimes we stay put, but we cut off our emotional connections. And sometimes we are sent into exile. But there is a place where our soul resides, even in the wildernesses. And that is the place of looking for what is in life. We look for that what is it that God provided for the children of Israel, the manna in the wilderness and then the land of promise. We look for the what is it that we find hope for. And as disciples of Jesus Christ, or as people who want to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we have another symbol, not a ring, but another symbol. It is the symbol of the cross. And it is that symbol that guides us in our wilderness experience. It is that symbol that we look to, to cut through times of exile and isolation, of war and difficulty. It is that symbol that we lift up and that we follow. For the power of life is found in the midst of suffering. 
So tell me, do you feel the rain or do you just get wet? Thanks be to God. Amen. May we affirm our faith by using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. He, the day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The Apostle Paul encouraged the church in Corinth to give as they have made up their minds not reluctantly nor under compulsion, for God loves it when we give from the joy that is in our hearts. May we give from the joy in our hearts so that we can share God's good news in this place and around the world.
Please pray with me. We give you thanks, Lord God, for the bounty of life that you have shared with us, and we offer these tokens of our lives and our livelihoods, and we ask that you use them and take them. You move us in so many ways. We ask that you offer us and use these gifts to be a path of reconciliation for ourselves, for our community, for the world, and for your church. Even in times of challenge and transition, you provide. So we lift up our concerns to you, Lord God. We do, those that we know and those that are unknown that circle around us. You prepare us for a certain places, Lord God, and you open up that path. May we seek your rule, trusting the great hope that we share in Jesus Christ. We offer our prayers in his name, and we pray in the way that he prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we make our way in the wilderness, a wilderness of our own making, a wilderness that comes to us, a wilderness of exile, but as we make our way, may we remember the power of the cross where God came to us and shared with us the life, the hope, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ so that there is hope not simply for that which will be, but there is hope even in our wilderness. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the wonder of the Holy Spirit surround you and be with you. May it be with you with every breath you take and every step you make this day and always. Go in peace. Amen.